Thank you and welcome everybody to this presentation about permission-based verification of red black trees and their merging. This is a case study that we have been working on last year. We being myself, Lukas Armbost, a PhD student at the University of Twente, and Professor Marika Hausmann. This case study is based on an industrial case from our partner in Elnet Labs. And I like how it combines the more academic endeavor of verifying a data structure with an actual industrial application. I want to start this presentation by first introducing some background about red black trees and about the logic we're using to verify them. Then the two main topics, the verification and formalization of the trees and the verification of the merging algorithm. And I will conclude with a brief discussion. So let's start with the logic, permission-based separation logic. This is an extension of whole logic. Most of you probably know it. So just as a brief recap, we have these triples of a program C, some preconditions P and some postconditions Q. And we verify that if the preconditions P hold before the program executes, then the postconditions hold after the program terminates. Here is an example using Java as the uh, programming language and JML, Java modeling language, as the verification language. So we see a precondition that the input is larger than zero. Then the program just doubles this value and we can verify that the result is actually larger than one. One challenge that we might face in this kind of program verification is coming from using heap memory, because if we access that via pointers, then two pointers can point to the same object and changing one implicitly also changes the other. That means we cannot just do localized reasoning and only consider, for example, the variables within C, because other variables might implicitly affect those variables. One way to deal with that is separation logic and an important construct in separation logic is the separating conjunct, A star B. That means A has to hold and B has to hold, and they have to hold in disjoint parts of the memory, as you can see in this diagram. And this allows us to again use localized reasoning because there cannot be any heap aliasing between A and B. Another challenge is coming from concurrency and permission-based separation logic is a way to deal with that. In permission-based separation logic, whenever you want to use a heap variable, you need to have permission to access that variable. So for example, to compare X and Y, we need to have permission for X and permission for Y. And these permissions are fractional permissions. That means they have a value between zero and one. One means we have right access and anything strictly between zero and one means we only have read access. All permissions for one specific uh, heap location summed up together must not exceed one. So we can have at most one write access, but we can have multiple read accesses at the same time so multiple concurrent threads can read the memory concurrently. Another important concept are predicates. They allow us to bundle permissions together. This makes the verification more modular and predicates are also allowed to be recursive, which helps us model the permission structure for recursive data structures, which we will see in a moment. And there are different tools using permission-based separation logic, we will focus on the Verco tool. Here is another example, a little bit more complex. So we have uh, an object which wraps an int, and then we have a predicate reader which bundles together the permissions for that object and for the value wrapped within that object. And you see the permissions for both these are one half. So two threads can concurrently read this value. 
And then if we want to use it, for example, here, writing it to an integer variable, then we need as a precondition to have this predicate. And here as a post condition, we ensure that afterwards we still have these permissions. The other part of background knowledge that we need are red black trees. Again, most of you probably know them, but as a reminder, they are binary search trees where each node is assigned a color, either red or black. And then there are multiple properties that a tree has to fulfill in order to be a valid red black tree. First, the two subtrees of a node again have to be valid red black trees, so it's a recursive definition. Second, the tree has to be black balanced. That means on every path from the root to any of the leaf nodes, we have to encounter the same number of black nodes. For example, here we have one, two black nodes and one, two black nodes and one, two black nodes. Another property is that there are no double reds allowed. That means on such a path from the root to a leaf, there cannot be two consecutive red nodes. So if we have a red node, then its children have to be black. Together, these two properties mean that the tree is roughly balanced. The longest path from the root to a leaf is at most twice as long as the shortest path. And then there is a fourth property which arises more from an implementation detail than from the tree structure itself. And that is there are no extra black markers allowed. We will see where that is coming from in a moment. So some implementations might not need this property, but for us, it's a property just like the other three. How does insertion work with such a red black tree? So just if we have a valid red black tree and we want to insert the node 23, then just like with any binary search tree, we start at the root and then recursively go down to the leaf position where the new node should be placed. And then we insert it as a red node. That means that the black balance is still maintained, but the double red property might be violated. And then after the recursive call, when we go back up, we have to do local corrections to again re-establish this property. What corrections can we do? One is to slightly change the structure of the tree by rotating it. The other is by just reassigning the colors. So in this case, we can push the black color from this node down to its two children and uh, color the node itself red. That means the black balance is still maintained. This double red down here is fixed, but we have introduced a double red on a higher level. So then the higher levels of the recursion again have to do localized corrections to ultimately re-establish the property like this. What we see here is that during the recursion, the red black tree properties can temporarily be violated. And this is of course important during the verification, as we will see in a moment. The other important operation is of course deletion. So if for example, we want to delete this node 11, then we could just remove it from the tree, but it is black. And that means just removing it would upset the black balance property. So to circumvent that, we leave a black marker behind. And those are the extra black markers that I mentioned before. And then like with the insertion, after we did the recursive call, the higher levels of the uh, recursion need to do localized corrections to re-establish the property. In this case, we rotate the subtree so that 18 becomes the root. And afterwards, we can reassign the colors to have a valid red black tree again. So again, during the operation, the properties might temporarily be violated, but in the end, we have again a valid red black tree. So how do we now formalize and verify this tree structure in permission-based separation logic? So first we have to define our permissions. 
We do that with a recursive predicate, treeperm, which bundles together the permissions for a node, so for the left pointer, the right pointer, the color, etc. And it also has the recursive predicate tree perm for the left subtree and the right subtree. We also include some sanity checks in the predicate. Having them within the predicate makes the verification a little easier. Additionally, we define a Boolean function valid, which encodes these properties of black balanceness, etc. And with these two together, we can then, for example, uh, define the pre and post conditions for the recursive insert. So we see the precondition is that we have the permission predicate and a valid red black tree. And as a post condition, we unfortunately cannot do it like that because we might violate the double red property. So we do have the permissions. We do know that there are no extra black markers and the tree is black balanced, but the double red property might be violated. And in order to be able to verify then that the localized corrections actually fix the problem ultimately, we need to do a careful analysis of how these properties might be violated. So for example, the double red is only allowed at the top of the tree and the root of the tree either has the same color as before or it changes it in a very particular way. And knowing these specific facts, we can then verify that we ultimately have a valid red black tree again. One lesson that we learned during the verification and formalization of the trees is the importance of a magic wand operator, also called separating implication. This is an operator within separation logic that is basically the dual to the separating conjunct. So while the separating conjunct allows us to split into two disjoint heaps, the magic wand allows us to merge them back together. So if we have something like A wand B, then we can join that with an A and together we can obtain a B. And we use this operator in the verification of the delete operation. And I think that shows that the operator is actually useful in real world verification cases. But unfortunately, several tools do not uh, support this operator or only support it in a limited way. So to all the tool developers among you, uh, please include support for the magic wand operator. So now that we have formalized the tree, let's take a look at an algorithm that actually uses that tree data structure. So this is a merging algorithm taken from the industrial case study where we have a set of red black trees and we want to merge them into one big red black tree. And how does this algorithm work? So first we have a set of parallel threads that each convert one tree into a sorted list. And then afterwards we have a group of uh, parallel threads that take two lists as input and produce one list as an output. And we do that in a hierarchical way so that ultimately we have one list containing all the nodes from all the given trees. And then we can turn that list back into a valid red black tree. So it's more uh, merging of lists than a merging of trees. Now what we see here with the intermediate list is that one thread is writing to it and another thread is reading notes from it. So it's a producer-consumer pattern. And in order to do that in a safe way, this intermediate list needs to be guarded by a lock. And if the producer would have to acquire the lock for every node that it wants to write, and the same for the consumer, then the two would block each other quite often, waiting for the lock to be free. So to be more efficient, the uh, industrial code actually uses batch processing. So we have a fixed size of, for example, four nodes, which consist one batch. And then the uh, producer writes the nodes to a local batch until that batch is full. 
and only then acquire the lock and submit the batch S1 to the queue. And likewise, the consumer reads an entire batch and then can process that batch locally without having to reacquire the lock for each node. And verifying this producer-consumer pattern and this batch processing was actually one of the main challenges in verifying this merging algorithm. So how did we tackle that challenge? So we have the local batch for the producer. We have the local batch that the consumer has full access to. And in between, we have the queue guarded by a lock. That means that the producer has no permission to directly access the queue. And therefore, we cannot verify that any node written by the queue by the producer actually ends up in the queue and ultimately with the consumer. So to circumvent that, we introduce ghost variables. That means these variables are not part of the executable code. They are just part of the specification for verification purposes. And in this case, the ghost variable all p shadows the queue and contains all nodes that were ever written by the producer to the queue, and likewise for all C. The difference between the two is that all P shares the permissions between the lock and the producer, while all C is shared between the lock and the consumer. So the producer can then verify that any node written by the producer is actually ends up in all P. The consumer, uh, for that we can verify that all nodes that it reads really come from old C. And the lock has enough permissions to make sure that old C and all P really represent the Q. Let's take a look how that uh, works in practice if we want to add a node to the Q. So for example, if the producer wants to write the node 22, it would write that to its local uh, batch, meaning that the batch is then full with four nodes. So then the producer acquires the lock and adds the new batch to the queue. While the producer holds the lock, it has both parts of the permission for OP, which add up to write permission, so we can update all P to also include the new batch. We would like to do the same for all C. Unfortunately, the consumer holds part of the permissions for this variable, so we cannot actually write to all C, meaning all C and all P can get out of sync. But we know that all C will always be a prefix of all P. These are again the uh, ownership permissions. It's the same as before, so to make the diagram a little bit more readable, I will leave them out. Now let's take a look at the consumer and how it reads a value from the queue. It tries to read from its local batch. In this case, that is empty, so we need to acquire the lock and read a batch into this local variable reading. Uh, while we hold the lock, the consumer has both parts of the permission for old C, so we can update old C and synchronize it again with OP. Afterwards, the uh, consumer can read the first node from its local batch, so the one is now dequeued. But for OP and old C, they really contain all nodes ever written, so as these dots indicate, the one is still part of those lists, those shadow lists. And with that, we can then ultimately verify that once the merging is complete, then all C and all P are equal for each intermediate list. And then via um, transitivity, we can conclude that the final tree actually contains the nodes from the given trees. We think that this pattern is rather reusable. So in other cases of a producer-consumer pattern where something is guarded by a lock, 
uh, we can again have these three resources for the three parties and have these shared shadow variables, these ghost variables, to define the interfaces between them. Now that we have this uh, producer-consumer pattern uh, figured out, we can then verify the merging algorithm. And that is not trivial, having to make sure with all this transitivity and everything, but it's also not that interesting, so I will skip it for this presentation. Instead, let's take a look at some findings from this case study. So first, we ultimately ended up with about 600 lines of executable code versus 2,400 lines of specification. It's about a ratio one to four. This shows that verifying code still requires significant effort from the developer, and it would be highly desirable to have some kind of automation there to automatically generate parts of these specifications to reduce the effort from the developer and make it more appealing for them to use software verification. On the other hand, we can also see that 600 lines of executable code, that's not just some academic toy example. This is starting to get towards real industrial code bases. So, and verifying these 600 lines or 3000 lines in total only took about five minutes on my laptop. So this shows that verification of industrial code bases is really getting more and more feasible nowadays. Another finding is that uh, we re-implemented parts of the code because originally the, the industrial code base was in C, but when this project started, the uh, tool support from Vercore for C was rather limited. So the decision was made to instead re-implement the red black trees in Java. In the meantime, the tool support for C uh, improved. And so nowadays we might be able to use Vercore on the original code base, but we instead decided to build with the merging algorithm on top of the existing verified Java implementation. Ultimately, this led us to have some slight divergence between the verified code and the original code base. For example, this explicit transformation of uh, input trees into sorted lists was not in the original code base. Uh, the uh, original code just did an in-order traversal of the tree. Later on, it would still be just merging of lists, but this first step was not done explicitly. But for us, it was easier with the resources and everything to do this step explicitly. Looking back, it might have been worth to investigate how to verify the in-order traversal and not do this step explicitly to be closer to the original code base so that the findings of the verification are more easily applied to the original code. And that concludes my presentation. To summarize, we have seen a red-black tree data structure fully verified in the Vercore tool using permission-based separation logic as the foundation. In the verification, we used the magic wand operator. So to the tool developers who are not yet supporting the magic wand, please consider doing that in the future. We have verified a concurrent algorithm that is built on top of this data structure, and we identified a reusable pattern in how we verified it. And ultimately, we have seen that verifying industrial code still takes significant effort, but it is feasible. And if there would be more automation, it would be even uh, more appealing to software developers. And it might be easy to re-implement things uh, in order to verify them uh, more easily, but uh, this can also lead to a divergence from the original code, making the results less applicable. That's it. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email, or of course, we can discuss now in the Q&A session. Thank you for listening.
Okay, I think we are live, Lucas. So first of all, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, I see clapping on and I want to join uh, the, okay. yeah. So uh, I don't see uh, any question in the chat, uh, but please uh, add uh, any questions uh, and I can uh, read them for you or you can raise your hands uh, at the uh, right uh, uh, top part of your screen. In the meantime, uh, I actually have a lot of questions, not qualification questions because your presentation was very clear, uh, but uh, more curiosity about uh, your collaboration with industry, right? So this this work is a case study coming off on industry needs. So actually I have a, se a sequence of questions about this, but let's start with the first one. How difficult was to set up this collaboration and find, you know, like a common ground to understand each other and the needs? Um, to be honest, I'm probably not the best person to answer that because uh, my uh, supervisor, Professor Hausmann, has already been working with this industry partner uh, before. And actually this particular case study already started uh, before I started my PhD, that there were some uh, initial master theses uh, to investigate how to verify the red black tree. So not yet the merging algorithm, but the red black tree structure. So I already joined basically an existing uh, uh, setup. So I don't know how easy it was to set it up. Um, I cannot answer that. You would have to ask uh, Marie Kausman. But how were the collaborations? So, like, uh, this was a setup team, and so, like, uh, people were on board totally. Did you have to interact? How were the interactions? So, I understand maybe the setup was another level of complication, but was the, uh, you know, like, uh, the collaboration fine? And as a follow up, uh, because you had this collaboration, is there some in the thinking about the side of this collaboration. So to be honest, it wasn't a very close collaboration. Uh, their code is online, publicly available. It's open source. So I could mostly work by myself just looking at their code. And uh, we had some exchange mostly via email about, OK, I have a question here and these kind of things. But it wasn't a very close collaboration. and. These exchanges, to be honest, took quite a bit of time. They were not the fastest to react to my questions. So uh, that also kind of made me a little hesitant to push further and further um, and made me more autonomous and trying to solve the things by myself because I knew I probably wouldn't get the fastest answer there. So um, a closer collaboration, maybe also trying to get some commitment from them to have uh, maybe regular meetings or something like that uh, would then be helpful. I mean, in this case, I could work on myself and I didn't need that much closer collaboration. I could solve things by myself. But uh, for future collaborations, I think that might be uh, helpful to have a closer bond there. Okay, so I don't see questions, so I, I have the time. I see we have one more minute, so I have the time to ask my last question. So in the in the presentation, you presented this exact, I mean, like all the encoding and the approach for, for this specific case study. Uh, so, and you were talking uh, in the presentation that some parts can be reusable. And so now I was wondering if there are some insight that, you know, like, uh, that you might have after this experience of things that can be uh, reusable or done in a way that you kind of build up a library uh, for for the future to be done. And I mean, uh, so for in the future, you know, like to be a, a, I don't know, a reusable library or something like that. Yeah, so we were actually thinking now that we have this uh, uh, red black tree data structure to uh, maybe make a library of data structures and also uh, formalize other similar data structures. So for example, B trees and these kind of things. and uh, turn them into a library of verified data structures that are then uh, reusable in the Verco tool. So that is indeed something that uh, we would like to do in the future. Uh, thanks. So I see and Simon hopefully and Lara. We can reuse the experience that we have from the red black tree to easily uh, trend, uh, to easily uh, port the uh, knowledge there. I think Laura question is uh, up similar. Yeah, we have, I, I mean, think, 10 a, seconds. Yeah. Yeah, so, and so uh, maybe we can discuss it the in the discussion, discussion room. Uh, Yes. Thank you, Laura and Simon, for the question and everybody else to attend. And thank you.